Hello, welcome to World Civilizations Since 1500. Now, we're starting session two of the third topic of the semester, the rise of the trading empires. And here we're going to proceed with uh, the series of trading empires that emerge from the 1400s all the way to the 1700s AD. Uh, in the first session, we started looking at the Ottoman Empire, for example, in the Eastern Mediterranean, again, it was founded by the Turks that took over the uh, Byzantine Empire, the capital city of Constantinople. And from there on, they built, they built a very vast empire across the region uh, that included the Arabian Peninsula, for example, uh, Egypt, uh, parts of North Africa, uh, present day uh, country of Turkey as well. And uh, at some point, they started really controlling the trade between uh, the Far East and the Middle East, and including Europe. And that led to a roadblock. You know, we talked about that in the first session, and that really uh, prevented the Europeans from participating in uh, the spice trade. Particularly, it was really the spice trade that was really in question here that the Europeans wanted to get a hold of, and that pushed uh, certain European kingdoms to pursue an alternative route. Of course, there was, you know, a confrontation, a battle between the Habsburgs, this dynasty of Europe, and the Ottomans, of course. Uh, that was a draw, and the, the Mediterranean Sea ended up being, being divided between an eastern section controlled by the Ottomans and the western controlled by the Habsburgs. But nonetheless, that pushed certain European kingdoms to pursue an alternative route, and we started looking at the Portuguese at the end of session one how the Portuguese are going to come out of the Iberian Peninsula and start exploring uh, the uh, Atlantic Ocean, particularly the coastlines of uh, the Iberian Peninsula. They're going to be moving into North Africa and eventually into West Africa. And th their idea was to move all the way to the Indian Ocean. Uh, so let's turn to our um, outline here. So we can continue looking at, again, uh, Portuguese exploration of uh, the coast of Africa. And initially, they're going to start moving into areas of North Africa. For example, in 1415, um, the Portuguese will be uh, arriving at critical centers of trade for example, in what constitute Morocco today, there was a very important trading outpost. That was the city of Ceuta. And they're going to capture that city uh, for the Portuguese, for the emergent, I will say, Portuguese trading empire. So again, this is really a trading empire in the making. So they're beginning to move outward. Uh, remember that we talked about how uh, there was a sort of uh, navigation revolution, so to speak, in Portugal, academies and new technologies that were added, of course, to larger vessels, and they're testing the waters, so to speak. The Portuguese are really the forerunners, the pioneers of a new age of navigation, and they will become known around the world as the masters of the sea. As a matter of fact, because uh, throughout their exploration, they're going to be accumulating significant knowledge critical knowledge about how the ocean works in terms of wind currents and ocean currents and the like. So uh, in this process of exploration, however, they will be uh, making contact with other societies. And in many cases, uh, they're going to be taking over certain regions that are critical for overseas trade, particularly the network. I mean, critical point in the network, in other words, and the global networks that, that we talked about in the past. So uh, now some of the issues, again, that the Portuguese raise whenever they confront other societies is religion. You know, remember that they come from the, the Crusades, you know, this Reconquista, you know, the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula from the Muslims, from the Arabs. And so they carry with them that zeal uh, along the way and one of the reasons that they take over, for example, the city of Ceuta here is, you know, 
uh, not only the trade, which is fundamental to their interest, but also the fact that this was a Muslim city as well. So again, th there's going to be uh, simultaneously uh, commercial conflict or rivalries, but at the same time, religious rivalries as well at stake. Okay. Now, from there, they continue moving along the coastline of uh, West Africa. Remember that their mission is to find a trade route to the Indian Ocean around Africa. So they do not have a clear idea of the extent of the African continent. So they're exploring. This is extremely important to understand. So again, they really don't know how extent it is. You know, there's thousands of miles, of course, and they're learning. And in every voyage, every year, they're creating maps. You know, they return back to Portugal, provide a report, and they continue sending missions every single year across the 1400s. Um, uh, across the early part of the 1400s, they uh, explore the bulge of Africa, as you can see uh, in this map. And from time to time, they arrive to the coastline. They explore the mainland, uh, not much, but they're just gathering information about it. Uh, they're trying to seek some resources like water and food, and they then they return back to Portugal and such. Again, so there, there, there is a process of exploration, but at the same time that this is so, uh, the Portuguese, as they're exploring West Africa, are going to start opening up relationships with some of the kingdoms that they're going to encounter. Okay, At some point, they will be arriving uh, to regions that are controlled by very powerful kingdoms. For example, the African Kingdom of Congo, for example. Um, this is something that early explorers started uh, encountering as early as 1444. So as early as 1444, the Portuguese explorers are cognizant of this kingdom, and they're establishing some form of diplomatic relationships with the leaders uh, of this kingdom. Remember, we talked about the kingdom of the Congo in the first uh, topic of the semester uh, when we were talking about, for example, social organization. Um, it, this is a a society in which there is at the very base of society an extended family, a series of tribal groups that share common ancestors. So it's an extended king group, in other words. And at the very top of this pyramid of tribal groups stand the Mani Congo. And the Mani Congo is really the king of this entire tribal organization that is comprised of a multiplicity of different tribal groups, each governed by a tribal leader. And there are negotiations, of course, between the Mani Congo and each tribal leader whenever, for example, uh, the Mani Congo needed manpower to go to war, uh, to engage in trade, for example, uh, territorial expansion for any kind of project or policy there needed to be some form of negotiation between the Mani Congo and the tribal leaders. Now, this is something that we discussed quite extensively you know, in the past, but this is going to become relevant because when the Portuguese arrive to the Congo, they're going to encounter that kind of organization, and they're going to have to kind of negotiate with the leaders in that fashion. But as we'll see, there will be significant radical change as well in the way that uh, the leaders of this kingdom are going to start exercising power as well. Again, so the Portuguese will bring change to the region, as we'll see. This change occurred in 1482 when a Portuguese merchant slash pioneer slash missionary by the name of Diego Chao arrive to the Congo and establish more direct diplomatic relationships with that kingdom and with the rulers, with the Mani Congo. Uh, he was 
an individual who had been really kind of establishing a series of outposts uh, in the bulge of Africa. So this is something of a kind of a procedure. He uh, had been building a series of training outposts for the Portuguese and pretty much arming, again, those training outposts as well. Um, so again, they're kind of establishing more direct control, the Portuguese, again, of the coastline uh, by negotiating with the leaders uh, of the different societies and kingdoms and arming them and, of course, creating more direct and more permanent uh, diplomatic exchange. And this, the same holds true with the Congo here. Um, now, as I mentioned, the Mani Congo was not an absolute ruler. You know, for anything that he needed to do, he needed to consult the other tribal leaders and such. Even, you know, for example, going to war, uh, he had to consult both the tribal leaders to get the manpower, but also the religious leaders as well. The religious leaders also in Congo played a key role in uh, consenting, so to speak, the actions of the king whenever the king wanted to go to war. You know, they needed to consult the stars or engage in divination practices to determine whether uh, the, the time was ripe in order to carry out warfare, for example. Okay, so again, th this was essential. Uh, so to a certain degree, the Mani Kango was constricted by so many different types of tribal norms and traditions. And the Portuguese offered a kind of way out out of those traditions and another way to exercise more direct, more absolute control over the kingdom. One of those ways, for example, was to free themselves from the constrictions of, for example, the religious leaders. Uh, and one of the ways that they tried to accomplish that was by converting to Christianity. So this is one of the accomplishments of Diego Chao was that he brought a mission to the Congo and he was successful, so to speak, in converting uh, the king, the Mani Congo, to Christianity. And again, this conversion was very practical from the perspective of the Mani Congo and out of expediency as well. Something we have been looking at in, in the past, again, we, we, we've been, you know, examining, for example, uh, the diffusion, the spread of world religions along commercial networks and the conversion of merchants, for example, or rulers out of expediency to facilitate, uh, to, to facilitate trade or to obtain more concessions and the like, you know, to be tax free and the like. So the same holds true here in West Africa. Uh, the Mani Kango is converting to Christianity because he does not want to be restricted or constricted by the religious leaders in exercising authority. So he really doesn't want to pay attention to them anymore whenever he wants to engage in warfare. Uh, now he's a Christian, so he doesn't really need to uh, ask permission again to uh, those priests, again, that will convene form a council whenever war had to be enacted, for example. And indeed, uh, there's a certain benefit to that, you know, as he's converting to Christianity, uh, he's obtaining more and more benefits, uh, more rewards from the Portuguese because the Portuguese are bringing, for example, technologies, in this case, military technologies that they lack, you know, guns, for example, gunpowder, muskets, and the like. So. Again, so the Mani Congo is indeed being armed, so to speak, with Portuguese weaponry, which is going to give them far more authority, more strength over not only his own people, but even his own neighboring kingdoms as well. So again, this is going to be something that many of the African kingdoms are going to be looking for. You know, they're going to be looking at the uh, favor and the support of the European powers that arrived. I mean, the Portuguese are the forerunners uh, in this process, but they're not going to be the only ones, but once again. And so they obtained those benefits uh, and they're going to carry out, of course, warfare in Africa because now they have better technology. Um, 
And of course, uh, Bibles as well. The Portuguese introduced Bibles for the massive conversion of the population of the Congo. And the Mani Congo is also going to be sponsoring, of course, Catholicism in his own domain. Okay. Uh, at some point, as we'll see, uh, the Mani Congos, uh, particularly one of the rulers uh, that emerges just at the turn of the century, uh, his name was Afonso. He actually changed his name to a Portuguese name, Afonso, uh, one of the kings of the Congo. He actually creates uh, a Catholic church in Congo, again, a Roman Catholic church. Okay, so there's now an established, you know, church in the Congo as well. Again, uh, in order to sponsor this missionary uh, activity of trying to convert as many people to Catholicism, of course. So the king is the representative of the religion. He is the absolute uh, authority as well of the realm. And so again, there is a change taking place, a very radical change taking place here in West Africa. Now, uh, the Portuguese also have significant influence in the royal affairs of the kingdom. Uh, they become even more involved as well because uh, some of the things that also the Mani Congo wanted to free themselves of was the limitation in terms of how, according to tribal traditions and norms, uh, the succession of power occurred you know, within the kingdom. So usually uh, in the African kingdom, when the king was about to die, uh, the throne will pass to a nephew. It will not immediately pass to the son, for example, uh, the way it was done back in Europe. Okay, and so this was done in order to guarantee uh, that uh, a member of the uh, the tribal group that was closest to the royal family will also have an access to authority as well. So there was a certain sharing of power from one family to another in order to strengthen the bonds, if you will, of the entire tribal group. So this was the tradition, but. The Mani Congo saw in the Portuguese system a better way to maintain power within a single family, in a, a dynasty in this case. So they're adopting a more European style secession, again, in which uh, the dying Mani Congo uh, of the late 1400s, as he's dying, he's going to leave his uh, authority uh, to his son, uh, the person I just mentioned and referenced a moment ago. Uh, a, a king that actually changed his name to Afonso again, that was one of the most typical names in Portugal of the monarchs of the kingdom of Portugal again. So this is also changing the nature of politics as well in, um, in Congo as well. Now, of course, this, as we'll see, is going to create a stronger relationship with the Portuguese, but at the same time, stronger dependency as well. Okay, there'll be increasing dependency on Portuguese aid. And over time, uh, the Portuguese are going to request more and more certain valuable commodities that the West African kingdoms had in abundance. One of them was, of course, gold. You know, they do have gold in abundance, but the other is slaves, again, the other commodity. And again, we're gonna see a growing dependency on slaves as well for aid. In order to receive the Portuguese aid, the, um, the African kingdoms were required to actually provide the Portuguese with more and more of that. Uh, commodity again is really a human beings in this case that uh, the Portuguese were exporting to Europe and also to America uh, to serve in the sugar plantations particularly but in in reality again it was just plantations overall whatever the plantations were generating so the Portuguese are the forerunners of opening up a new network with West Africa. Again, they are indeed starting there as they're trying to explore that region, 
they're initiating this kind of network. They're connecting now the European system uh, of the Western Mediterranean with now West Africa. And the Portuguese are in control, and they will remain in control for until about 1600. Again, so they're going to pretty much monopolize that West African trade. And they're trading with a series of kingdoms like Congo, Angola, and Senegal. It's not just Congo. There were others, of course, that were also uh, brought in into the network. And there is an exchange of uh, merchandise, more bartering than anything else um, that is taking place. Uh, the West African kingdoms, for example, demand certain commodities that they found very valuable from, from the Portuguese, like horses, for example, uh, weapons, now, once again, to increase their power, uh, and they're building their own armies as well. Um, and this, again, is one of the most value, va valuable assets, again, that they're trading with the Portuguese, iron tools like skillets, for example, brass utensils, and the like. And the Portuguese, in turn, demand something from those West African kingdoms that the Portuguese are trading in Europe for gold and silver, and that there's a great market in Europe, and there will be a great market also once America is discovered, uh, there will be also a great market as well uh, all over the world. Again, once we see uh, a more complete uh, global network that interconnected uh, America and Europe, uh, Africa with the rest of the world. And in this case, we're talking, for example, about African textiles. Uh, those African kingdoms were known for producing textiles that were uh, very, very colorful, for example, um, and had very uh, uh, interesting designs that correspond to the uh, cosmological uh, worldview of the West African kingdoms. And uh, they were considered highly exotic as well by the Europeans. And now uh, the West African kingdoms are trying to engage in mass production. Again, so this is going to lead to domestic manufacturing in West Africa. Again, the, the kings of those kingdoms, Congo, Senegal, and Angola, are now commissioning thousands of artisans to engage in the mass production of textiles for exports. Again, so keep that in mind, again, how the trade between the Europeans and other societies will lead to the rise of domestic manufacturing, okay? Um, also peppers, you know, there are certain strands, uh, varieties of peppers in West Africa that the Europeans will uh, accept as a substitute for the kind of uh, spices, let's say, that they were obtaining from, from the Indian Ocean at least for a while. Uh, gold also is being exported out of West Africa. And as I explained a moment ago, also slaves as well. Initially, slaves were not uh, the priority in the list, at least before the discovery of America, slaves were part of the list, but they were not a priority because there was not really a market for that. Uh, not to the point when, for example, when America was discovered, there will be a huge market a huge demand for labor, particularly for the plantations again. So again, this is going to skyrocket the slave trade once we move into the 1500s and beyond, okay? So as you can see in this map, we see the Portuguese really building a new network, okay? So this is a network in the making. And they are indeed uh, setting their eyes to Indian Ocean. Uh, they're not content to having opened up the market, if you will, and trade, with West Africa, they're pursuing, again, a new network in uh, the Indian Ocean. They're trying to circumvent uh, Africa and find a trade route to India, okay? And eventually they will reach India, the Indian Ocean. They will also reach the Southeast Asian network as well, the Strait of Malacca as well, and they will go around it and reach also uh, the China Sea. Okay, uh, this is a, again, an, an ongoing process across the 1400s. Bartolomé Díaz, for example, is the one that uh, reaches the Indian Ocean in 1488. He was really the first one to arrive from Europe directly, again, sailing from Iberia all the way to India. It took him many, many months. And of course, it was a very, very long stretch. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that Columbus 
sail west uh, to the Far East, so to speak, was precisely because uh, Bartolome Diaz had taken just so long to reach India going around Africa. So, you know, Columbus wanted to find that trade route, uh, which will be much shorter by sailing west. Okay. Uh, in 1497, Vasco de Gama reached a port in South India, uh, the western coast of India uh, was called Goa, and established relationships with the merchants of Goa. And eventually, by 1510, the Portuguese had already been given really uh, access to the Goa trade, and they established an outpost again in India. This is again uh, a, a great accomplishment by the uh, the standards and even the expectations again of Europeans is to now deal directly with the uh, suppliers of black peppers, for example, and textiles and spices again in the Indian Ocean, they're already there. They have established themselves there already by 1510. And by 1557, they reach the China Sea and they also establish uh, a trading outpost as well in the uh, port of uh, Macau as well, again, in the China coast as well. So they are indeed now moving quite fast into the Far East and tapping into those Asian markets. And they're really the forerunners of this kind of network. You know, when Europe moves directly again into the Far East. Okay. So now, now that they have established permanent relationships, let's say in Goa and also in China as well, in Southeast Asia and the like, uh, the Portuguese will also attempt to create a trade monopoly. And this is going to be a kind of a, preoccupation of all of the trading empires that we're going to be discussing. You know, uh, the Ottomans did that as well by creating this roadblock and trying to control the spice trade, for example. I mean, they are trying to exercise a trade monopoly by doing that, okay? By creating a trade monopoly, they're going to uh, create uh, a also a monopoly of price control. They're going to control prices because if you are indeed controlling all the trade, and you have no competition, then you can establish, you can fix prices at whatever rate you want uh, to ex extract the maximum amount, of course, of profits, in this case, gold and silver. That is really the, pr the purpose of any monopoly. Again, it's price fixing, okay, it's price fixing. So there were several ways that the Portuguese were trying to exercise this trade monopoly, particularly in the new network they establish in the Indian Ocean and beyond, again, in that new network that they have moved into. One way was by establishing, for example, or setting up uh, cannons in their ships. You know, just below deck, they will put a series of cannons in order to move into the Indian Ocean and through the use of sheer force, for example, either uh, open up trade with certain societies or seize control of certain locations, certain key points uh, that were instrumental, let us just say, vital in the flow of goods from one region to another, for example. Again, so this is going to be, first and foremost, one of the first stepping stones, again, is to create a new kind of vessel that is going to have that kind of firing power artillery again, power in order to uh, enforce the monopoly, again. So they realized that across the network, there were certain, once again, key locations where merchants that were moving, let's say, from China into the Indian Ocean, they will have to go through the Straits of Malacca, for example, in Southeast Asia, as you can see, and they will arrive also to uh, the Indian Ocean, the southern tip of India, uh, to Calicut, for example, or Goa. And then from there, merchants moving into the Middle East will have to go to the port of, the port of Hormuz uh, and so on. Uh, and so what they were trying to do then is to seize control of those key locations and create what they called choke points. And the choke points, you know, 
Uh, they already took control of Goa in 1510, which was a major choke point that connected, let us just say, Southeast Asia and Hormuz. And they're going to be moving, of course, in both directions, seizing Malacca in 1511, um, in Southeast Asia, and also in Hormuz in 1515. And by attempting to do that, they're attempting to control the flow of goods and also to tax, of course, those goods as people are crossing from one region to another. Again, so they're attempting to exercise control of that network by doing this kind of strategy, a strategy that was not going to be easy to implement just because, again, uh, the Portuguese are barely emerging as a naval force, so they're not going to have the wherewithal to really enforce their monopolistic um, system in such a vast region that is navigated by thousands of merchants and can be totally circumscribed, if you will, on so many points. And uh, the Portuguese are not going to keep track with just so much traffic, so to speak, taking place. And they realized that. So one other strategy that they implement was creating a system of license as well. This is another attempt to create a monopoly, a license system. Again, they call it the cartaces, for example. Uh, a license system is really what it is, is, you know, is a permit to trade that you have to, uh, you have to obtain in Portugal. That in order to trade in the Indian Ocean, you needed to go to Portugal and ask for a permit or a cartaces, as it was called, uh, or a license, and that will require paying a fee, in other words, a tax, now 20% tax, for example, uh, to the Portuguese in order to just carry out trade in the Indian Ocean. And uh, because now the Portuguese have cannons in their ships, now they felt that it was their right to stop ships on the high seas in the Indian Ocean, for example, or in Hormuz, for example, in Southeast Asia, and ask those vessels for their proper licenses. And if they did not have those licenses, then they felt entitled to seize the cargo, again, as a form of punishment, again. So uh, this is also that was attempted by the Portuguese, but that's something that was totally undoable as well. I mean, the, the Portuguese are not going to really have the capacity to monitor and regulate just so much trade taking place in this network. And obviously, uh, people are trying to circumvent uh, the Portuguese uh, monopoly at all costs, and they're going to engage in what is called smuggling. So again, this is going to lead to, to the rise of smuggling, again, uh, on a massive scale, okay? So keep that in mind, that with the rise of monopolies that we're seeing here, you know, with the rise of the trading empires, we're going to see the rise of monopolies. With the rise of monopolies, we're also going to see the rise of smugglers as well. You know, people that are trying to engage in what they call free trade. Well, you know, before the monopoly, we engage in free trade. I mean, there was no power here, you know, enforcing rules or, you know, exercising total control of the trade. And so people are just moving around the network and finding alternative uh, routes and so on. And again, this is going to lead to uh, the, the rise of a new kind of legal category. And what that is, is that people that violate the, 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 the rules of trade, uh, the, the trade, in this case, the monopolistic trade, again, will be labeled as smugglers, okay? All right, so let's now look at another Iberian uh, society that is going to rise as well uh, on, on the world stage and build their own kind of trading empire. They're all different, you know, all the trading empires that we're going to be discussing here uh, in this topic. And we're talking about the Spanish trading empire here that was, for the most part, built by the Habsburgs. Remember, this is the dynastic family in Europe that controlled a series of kingdoms scattered across Europe uh, that battled the Ottomans, for example. And one of the kingdoms that they ended up uh, controlling was the kingdom of Spain. But it was really a vast, uh, a multi-kind of, like a multinational kind of system 
that they were that they were able to build. And they're going to be building a new empire, the Spanish Empire. Uh, a little background here, you know, please keep in, keep in mind that when we talk about, for example, Spain or the Iberian Peninsula, keep in mind that this is a peninsula that at one point, uh, around 450 AD, with the fall of the Roman Empire, this region was actually invaded by a series of Germanic tribes known as the Visigoths. So this is very important. Again, those were nomadic groups that seized control of the Iberian Peninsula, built a series of kingdoms, um, and they were very, very militaristic. This is a highly militarized society for the reason that I just explained. Those were nomadic groups coming from Central Europe, the Germans, they're warlike, you know, they practice warfare, and the rulers are going to carry out that culture, you know, into the future. It is also a highly militarized society because when the Iberian Peninsula was invaded by the uh, by the Arabs and brought, of course, uh, Islam into the Iberian Peninsula, those kingdoms are going to, even though they were conquered by the Arabs, are going to lead an insurgency, so to speak, okay, to try to oust the Arabs from the peninsula. This is a process that was known as the Reconquista. Again, we talked about that, you know, with the Portuguese is the same thing. Again, they're part of the same process. Again, that for many, many centuries, uh, the Iberians, or what we call today the Spaniards, were constantly fighting the Moors or the Arabs, again, trying to expel them from the land, of course. So again, warfare becomes part of everyday reality, and this is a highly militarized culture as well as a result of the La Reconquista. Now, in 1469, Two of the largest kingdoms of Iberia that had expelled the Moors, the kingdom of Aragon and Castile, unified, and they created the kingdom of Spain. Again, this was done in 1469. And the unification of those two very large political entities that have freed themselves from the Moors, so to speak, and this Reconquista, uh, was accomplished by the marriage of the rulers of each uh, kingdom, okay? Uh, it was a marriage between Isabella and Ferdinand, okay? Isabella was the queen of Castile, Ferdinand was the king of Aragon. They got married and with that, they unified their properties, so to speak, and created a single, single kingdom, okay? The kingdom of Spain. Now, what's very significant here and this is going to help us understand the trading empire and how it exercised control, uh, particularly overseas, is that uh, this new monarchy uh, exercised control at all levels. It centralized authority, okay? That this was not a parliamentary system. Again, the kings really delegated authority, dictated laws, again, from the top down. So it's a highly centralized state, again. So they did not share power with a group of nobles or lords, again, with a parliament, etc. Again, this was, again, uh, a centralized authority and also absolute as well. Again, it's called absolutism as well. You know, this we see this uh, new tradition emerging uh, in, in, in the new newly formed kingdom of Spain. They're considered the absolute rulers because they made a deal, again, with the Church of Rome. Uh, to continue this process of La Reconquista, trying to expel, for example, the Moors completely out of Iberia, but at the same time, trying to enforce Catholicism within the kingdom and even to carry out this new mission, again, to spread the faith, to press, uh, spread Christianity everywhere as possible uh, across Europe. Again, so the Pope, in this case, of the Church of Rome, uh, granted the monarchs of Spain with this new type of divine aura, so to speak, that the Pope is saying, well, you, the rulers of Spain, have been chosen by God to spread Christianity, so your right to rule comes from God. 
again, so we see this new tradition called the divine rights of kings, for example, okay, that they are indeed Catholic kings, and they are to create a Catholic state to enforce a common identity across Spain, in other words, to unify all peoples from every background, linguistic background, to create a common identity. In other words, that will be Catholic. That way, again, the kings are going to be held legitimate, you know, because they are indeed divine rulers, but at the same time, the Church of Rome is going to benefit because more and more uh, people are going to be brought in into the faith as well. So this was a symbiotic alliance between, again, the monarchs, again, and the Church of Rome. Now, this is where the Habsburgs, you know, come in. Uh, the offspring of Isabella and Ferdinand, they have an offspring, you know, it was called Juana, or Johanna in this case, Juana, uh, was married with uh, the offspring of the rulers of Austria, the Habsburg dynasty, Philip in this case. So by marrying, again, the newly created kingdom of Spain with the prince Habsburg of Austria, by marrying them, again, a new dynasty is created in Spain. Again, now Spain will be ruled by the Habsburgs as well. So once again, this is a multi-state empire that comprised not only Spain, but it also comprised Austria. It comprised a series of German principalities in Central Europe and also some principalities in Italy. It was a vast, again, uh, imperial domain. And so Spain is part of this process. And as the Habsburgs battled, of course, the Ottomans for the Mediterranean trade, and there was no solution to the roadblock, uh, this is going to lead the Habsburgs to actually sail west. Once again, the solution to the roadblock, once again, was to find a trade route to the Far East. But instead of moving around Africa, again, Christopher Columbus will be sponsored. And we're going to see the, a discovery in 1492, the discovery of America. And with the discovery of America, the Habsburg dynasty that is ruling Spain and, of course, the other European states uh, is going to engage in the uh, conquest uh, of some Native American empires. Uh, and at the same time, the process of colonization as well. And by doing this, they're going to start building a trading empire in their own right. Now, Keep in mind that the reconquest of Spain that took about seven centuries to accomplish led to the rise of a series of warlords that were fighting for their Christian monarchs. You know, and in Spain, the idea is that there were certain knights or warlords again, that will go out and fight the Moors or the Arabs. And if they will conquer, let's say, additional lands from the Arabs, they will be rewarded by their Christian kings. They'll be given land grants, for example. Okay. And so over time, uh, back in Spain, they were known as the conquistadors, the conquerors. In other words, the conquerors of lands on behalf of the Christian kings. This is part of the crusade and so on. And again, now we have a new group arriving to the new world in search for gold and land. Those were the conquistadors. Those were the knights. Those were actually people of the uh, Spanish military of high rank that were coming to the New World with that mission. And the mission was, again, very, very specific. The mission is we're coming here to also you know, uh, conquer new lands uh, for the Spanish kings because in what we're actually looking for is a reward. We want to be rewarded you know, with glory. We want to be rewarded with land, land grants and gold, etc. Again, so this is going to lead to the conquest of native empires. And this was, again, key in order to establish the trading empire that Spain was looking for. And one of the first uh, native empires that the, the Spanish encountered uh, and this is going to be, again, fundamental because, you know, this is an empire that control 
vast portions of what is called today Central Mexico and some sections of Central America. Uh, and it was a kind of trading empire as well in that they control also trading networks. They uh, extracted tribute from local populations of various precious goods as well. And they possessed also a lot of gold. Okay, they Even though gold for them was not considered currency, they did not use. The Aztecs did not use gold for a commercial exchange uh, or for trading operations. They had vast quantities of it because they use it for, they use gold for religious purposes. Again, it was mainly to adorn and decorate the temples, to decorate the different attires of the of the governors and the emperors and the like. So they have vast quantities of that. Uh, this was not the only empire that possessed vast quantities. Also, the one that we're going to get to see in just a few moments, the Incas also possessed a lot of gold. So this is exactly what the conquistadors that came into the New World uh, were informed by other Native American groups in the Caribbean when, again, the Spaniards initially arrived. They arrived to the Caribbean islands, um, and they were informed about, again, the Aztecs and the Incas having a lot of gold. And so this is an empire that had just been formed uh, in central Mexico from 1260 And as we explored in the previous topic, it collapsed in 1521. One of the reasons had to do with, of course, epidemics. Now, here, we're not going to uh, explore that angle of the conquest. Again, we're just going to keep uh, the uh, that information, uh, of course, the factor of epidemics. We're going to, of course, uh, keep an eye on that. And it's going to be very, very significant for the fall of those two empires. But um, what we're going to be looking at here is we're going to look at other critical factors that led to the fall of those two empires. Uh, That is going to help us explain the kind of uh, trading empire that uh, Spain built in the New World. So as we mentioned, in 1519, uh, one such military figure that was already living in Cuba and the Spanish colony of Cuba was sent in 1519 on an expedition to verify if indeed the Aztecs had the gold that the natives from the Caribbean islands were actually saying. Again, that, you know, there was a lot of gold, uh, you know, in central Mexico. So Hernán Cortés will be sent with 500 soldiers. Eventually he will be uh, ad- adding an additional 500 more uh, down the line, you know. So he's going to be uh, marching into central Mexico with what about maybe uh, no more than 1,000 soldiers, 1,000. And as he's marching, you know, from the Gulf of Mexico to what today is Mexico City um, to meet the rulers there of that region, uh, the emperor of the Aztecs, He's going to develop a series of alliances along the way. So again, the role of Indian alliances was critical as well to help Cortes topple the Aztec Empire. Okay, those were actually societies that uh, detested the Aztecs because of the ruthless, for example, tactics that the Aztecs carried out year by year of taking captives for uh, to be used for sacrificial offerings in their temples. The Aztecs practiced human sacrifice. And of course, uh, the Aztecs demanded tribute for all the communities that they conquered in terms of victims to be sacrificed every year in the temples, of course. So again, the, Cortes is going to be able to befriend them and build those alliances. And one of the successes for building those alliances, you know, was that Cortes had at his disposal uh, uh, an interpreter, so to speak. It was an an indigenous woman that had made contact with Spaniards, for example, in the past. And she was also very proficient in different indigenous language. So she knew the language of the Aztecs, Nahuatl, 
for example, she knew Maya. Again, she was a Mayan-speaking uh, native uh, woman. And there were some soldiers that were marching with Cortes that had learned Maya. You know, previously, in previous years, when he explored the Maya region, he actually learned Maya. So again, she is going to be instrumental in uh, translating what the Aztecs were saying to Cortes by translating the messages from Nahuatl to Maya. And from Maya, she will tell it to one of those Cortes soldiers who then translated that message again in Spanish to Cortes. So uh, her name was La Malinche again, and she's going to be instrumental in showing Cortes how the, the Aztecs in this case uh, carried out warfare, for example, how the Aztecs uh, interpreted the world around them. In other words, she actually served as uh, as the cultural eyes of the indigenous world to Cortes. So for Cortes to actually understand very clearly, you know, the not only the worldview but also the world of politics, uh, the economic world the uh, the cultural world again virtually every aspect of society so again he gained you know significant knowledge about those societies so he was able to gain a significant advantage over them through la malinche so he's building a series of alliances the two major uh, societies that come to his aid were the tlaxcaltecas as they were known as the otomis again those were actually groups that constantly fought the Aztecs, and they had not yet been conquered, and they're going to provide tens of thousands of soldiers uh, to aid him in the conquest. Again, the Tlaxcaltecas and the Otomis. Okay? Now, another issue that is also significant for understanding the fall of the uh, Aztecs and the, um, and the Incas was the role of native religious ideas. And that is that within the Aztec world, for example, there were a series of prophetic ideas tied to calendars, for example, in which the Aztecs were convinced that uh, an ancient god by the name of Quetzalcoatl was going to re return in one of the calendar years of their major, major sacred calendar. They had a 52-year calendar that repeated itself endlessly. Okay. So they believe that in one of those years of the 52-year calendar, uh, one of the ancient gods, Quetzalcoatl, was going to return in order to destroy the Aztecs. You know, he had announced his return from the east on that year. And it just so happens that when Cortes showed up on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, on the port, what is today the port of Veracruz, it corresponded, 1519, the European year, with that year of the Aztec calendar. Again, so. This had a profound psychological effect, particularly on the leadership, that they believed that this was really the end of their civilization, that there was no coincidence that strangers, foreigners arriving, you know, in strange vessels, in mountains, they call them, you know, those ships were, co were called mountains and so on, that it was no coincidence that, no, that they were arriving on that year that this was really the doings of Quetzalcoatl, you know, that their world was going to be smashed to pieces, in other words, okay? Another issue that served to defeat the Aztecs was uh, the need to carry out rituals uh, before engaging in warfare, for example. You know, for the Aztecs, warfare was not just, you know, the notion of, oh, let's just go to battle because this is practical, this is what we must do in order to defeat the opponent, because this is convenient, because you know the time is ripe and so on, but rather they needed to appeal to their gods and dance for days and days and ask the gods for their aid and blessings before they will engage in battle. And you know, even warfare itself, the activity that we call warfare was considered also a ritual, a ritual activity. And so this is actually is going to give the Spaniards an upper hand in getting away in many cases when the Aztecs had all the opportunity to ambush them, for example, or trap them, just because, again, uh, the Aztecs needed to perform those rituals. 
Again, so in one occasion, uh, the Spaniards were actually trapped inside of the city of Tenochtitlan in that island, you know, in the middle of the lake. Um, and, you know, when the Aztecs uh, were already showing hostilities against them, uh, one of the reasons why the Spaniards were able to leave and flee uh, was because the Aztecs started doing those rituals. In other words, you know, they were really so concerned with religious uh, ceremonies and rites that that provided an opportunity for the Spaniards to flee and get away. Okay. Uh, uh, another thing was, again, human sacrifice. Again, they believed that the sun god needed to be nourished, you know, uh, uh, every day with human hearts, you know, to sacrifice them on temples. And why is this going to be a limitation? Well, this is going to be also a limitation because in many cases, when the Spaniards were you know, during battle with the Aztecs, for example, when they were captured, uh, instead of the Aztecs proceeding with the, with warfare and continuing to, uh, you know, uh, attack other Spaniards uh, in the front lines, that they will actually take the time to, you know, drag the Spaniards alive in many cases and bring them into the temple and then sacrifice them into the temple because. This is something that they needed to do in order to feed the sun god, for example. So again, you know, religion is going to st stand in the way between, you know, the Aztecs being able to carry out warfare in a more practical manner and defeat the Spaniards, which were really just a handful of them. As I mentioned, there were just like a thousand of them, whereas the uh, the Aztec imperial army was very vast, you know, numbering to tens of thousands of, of soldiers. Uh, this is, of course, not to diminish the role of epidemic disease. Epidemic disease is going to decimate the Aztec leadership, and the top generals, many of them are going to die from smallpox due as a result of this outbreak of disease that I explained uh, previously in a previous topic. And so that was another factor as well. As you can see, again, the, the Aztecs needed to perform those rituals. So even though the Spaniards were captured, they had to be taken to the temples for, for sacrifice. So again, it was a culture that was very ritualistic and even warfare had to be practiced in specific ways that uh, the Spaniards, of course, even though they were also very religious oriented, they were not that, again, bent on, on carrying out warfare in that fashion. They were far more practical. In other words, so in 1521, the, the city, Tenochtitlan, falls. Uh, there is a siege. Of course, uh, it is surrounded on all sides by the indigenous allies and the Spaniards. And of course, smallpox uh, starts spreading inside of the city, famine as well. And by the time the Spaniards move in in 1521, when they finally move in, there is Street fighting, again, it is really, again, very chaotic at that point. And uh, the Spaniards uh, believe that the only way to ensure that there will be no more uh, resistance, again, that the Aztec uh, Empire will completely collapse was by pretty much decimating the entire city. They practice something called scorch earth warfare. They destroy everything, in other words, temples and everything, you know, everything was completely destroyed. Again, so this was the, the epic, if you will, battle uh, uh, of uh, the Spanish conquest against the Aztecs. Again, so now in terms of the Inca Empire, we also talked about how the conquistadors uh, will be moving into the south you know, of the continent. In 1532, we see the arrival of Francisco Pizarro, and he, once he arrives, he encounters, of course, a society that was already in disintegration. Uh, there was a, a, a smallpox epidemic that had arrived there. Uh, it had generated, of course, instability, political instability, a civil war. The death of the emperor, Huayna Capac, led to the war between two brothers, Atahualpa and Huascar. We mentioned that. And uh, the... Uh, the empire was disintegrating as many, many soldiers were actually dying again from that disease. Uh, Atahualpa, of course, will be captured and he will be executed, of course, not, not, not until he paid 
uh, Pizarro uh, a huge sum of gold, you know, for his ransom, but eventually he was actually executed. Now, we cover that, but here we also see the role of native religious ideas uh, kind of getting in, in the way of the Incas, you know, successfully repelling this new force that had just arrived, you know, Pizarro and his 400 soldiers. Uh, here, for example, some of the native religious ideas that contributed to the defeat of the Incas had to do with, for example, ideas about the Spaniards interpreted to be strange entities arriving perhaps from other worlds. Uh, in Inca religion, for example, it was believed that from time to time, the thunder gods will show up to destroy their civilization, you know, the wicked, for example, uh, uh, the evildoers and the like. Uh, and in Inca religion, the thunder gods were depicted white. So, so when they saw the Spaniards arrive to the land, and they saw them white, of course, they, at, at some level, um, believed that they were encountering the thunder gods. And of course, when they heard the roar of their muskets and their cannons, they became terrified. Again, add those weapons, and they, they fled for their lives. And that kind of facilitated, of course, the conquest as well. Okay, uh, This is not to ignore that the death of the emperors, like Huayna Capac, for example, and his son that died from smallpox, and of course, uh, Atahualpa, who was murdered by uh, Pizarro, those were considered divinities. Remember, they were considered really the incarnations of the sun god. So that was really devastating for, um, for those societies. How is it that a divine figure can actually die from those mysterious diseases, for example, or they can easily be uh, arrested by other people and be murdered in that way. Again, so that was very shattering. So that was also, again, served as a way to uh, to defeat the Incas uh, on a psychological level as well. Now, the Spaniards are, of course, promoters of the Christian faith, and they're going to engage in this process of evangelization. Once that they, they take over Central Mexico and South America, they're trying to spread the faith. Okay, so they're also engaging in a spiritual conquest. Again, uh, they are going to bring in thousands of Catholic religious missionaries. Again, those are members of the religious orders, for example, that back in Europe were in charge of spreading Christianity across Europe, you know, trying to convert the pagans, so to speak, to the Christian faith, uh, particularly the Franciscans and the Augustinians, for example, will be arriving to the New World, establishing a series of missions. The idea of the mission was to bring in the Native American population, particularly children, and also the sons of the nobility, the indigenous nobility, to be Christianized so they will learn Spanish. And by doing that, by teaching them Spanish, you know, they will, you know, instill in them the doctrine you know, the main tenets of the Christian faith, to baptize them, and to convert them again into uh, Christianity. Again, so this is their mission, again, to spread the faith. Now, of course, those missionaries are trying to, at the same time that they're trying to spread the faith, they're trying to eliminate also the native priesthood as well. You know, they see certain obstacles in doing this. You know, how do we actually change you know, the mindset, the convictions of the indigenous groups. So they will be loyal, again, to the king of Spain. Remember, the primary goal here of converting the natives was not just to save their souls, which, of course, a great many of those Catholic orders, you know, are so convinced of, but the main purpose, there's a practical political purpose. If you convert the native to Christianity, you create a common Catholic identity. And by creating a common Catholic identity, uh, the legitimacy of the ruler, who is 3,000 miles away back in Spain, is going to be reinforced here in the colony. In other words, the natives will see that once they're Catholic, that the ruler, 
that you know the king is actually appointed by God that you know that it is in their best interest to follow Spanish law because this is the law not only of the land but this is the law of God as well so there's a political of course objective as well okay so those that stand in the way of creating a common Catholic identity are the native priest. So they're trying to eliminate the native priesthood. Their public ceremonies are abolished as well. All of the ceremonies that the indigenous societies practice, again, in front of the people, again, are totally abolished. They're also engaged in the destruction of native knowledge, you know, the knowledge of the Native Americans. They wrote their knowledge in, uh, in, in skins of animals, for example, barks of paper related to histories and calendars, mythologies, all of that knowledge is going to be destroyed. Uh, and what the friars were doing, uh, the missionaries were going from village to village, gathering, for example, those manuscripts and removing them from, uh, from the population, in many cases, destroying them. Uh, the best case of this kind of destruction occurred, for example, in the Yucatan Peninsula, when the bishop, Diego de Landa, in the Yucatan Peninsula in the 1560s, carried out a, a, an act of faith, as it was called. Uh, it's called the auto de fe. It's an act of faith. And so what an act of faith is, is that they're indeed judging the infidels, for example, the, the, the heretics. They're indeed bringing to justice those that break God's laws, for example. And they accuse about a hundred shamans or priests of being in cahoots with the devil and trying to obstruct the efforts of the friars in spreading the faith. And this occurred in the town of Mani in Yucatan again. And uh, they gathered 5,000. Again, manuscripts and religious objects, figurines of different kinds, everything that reminded the population of their ancestral religion was burned, again, in this auto de fe or act of faith, if you will, this trial. It was a trial of the Inquisition, actually, of the Spanish Inquisition. Again, so all of the knowledge that the Mayas of Yucatan had built over centuries was burned in one day. Again, and from there on, the friars are now rewriting the history of the natives according to how they heard the stories from their indigenous informants. So most of the things that we know from indigenous cultures, whether they're the Aztecs or the Mayas or otherwise, come from the pens of those religious uh, missionaries, okay? Now, besides a spiritual conquest uh, the Spaniards are, of course, trying to build a trading empire, so they're also building a, or carrying out, uh, a material conquest, okay? And they're engaged in this massive territorial expansion, and uh, after those two empires are toppled, they're exploring, they're sending explorers far and wide in different directions, and as they're moving in different directions, they're establishing claims, again, uh, across vast regions of the Americas. You know, for example, the uh, uh, region of what today is Florida, the Gulf of Mexico, and the American South was explored and claimed by Spanish explorers. Of course, the American Southwest, all of Mexico, Central America, and great portions of South America as well. As you can see, this will become eventually uh, the Spanish Empire in the Western Hemisphere. Now, one of the mechanisms for carrying out this material conquest uh, that engage, of course, a massive uh, territorial expansion was a policy that the Spanish monarchy implemented was called requerimiento, the requirement, okay, requerimiento, the requirement. Okay, so what the requirement or requerimiento was, was that as the conquistadors were moving, and the explorers together, as they were moving from region to region, they carry with them a member of the Catholic order, again, whether it's the Franciscan or Augustinian, for example, and a high member of the church, of the hierarchy. And they will 
read a certain statement to the population of a region saying, you know, we are here you know, as the representatives of the Christian church, and it is required for you to submit to the faith, baptize, convert, and you will become a loyal subject of the king of Spain. Otherwise, again, the conquistadors will carry out the conquest by force. So again, they were given the chance, in other words, to uh, submit to Spanish rule um, the, the easy way by converting. Otherwise, the conquistadors will actually enact force, in other words. Okay, so this was the mechanism the, that the Spaniards used to actually conquer territory. Again, it's called the requerimiento. And after they did this, they started then really imposing their own economic institutions in order to extract wealth from the realm, again, from uh, the colonial world in the Americas. Okay, now they realized, however, that it was not going to be that easy to simply move into an area and tell people to, you know, work in the mines, for example, or work in the fields, that they learned that this was a kinship society. Everywhere they went, you know, people live in king groups, okay, king groups, extended family groups, and people obey their tribal chief or their uh, leader of the king group at the family level, the community level. There were so many different leaders, again, at the family, community, community level, uh, at the village level, and, and so on. And those were the king leaders, for example. And so what the Spaniards did was to make an arrangement with those king leaders, okay? And they offer them privileges. That look, we would like to access the labor of the people, but since they only obey you, the leader of the king group, then uh, we're going to make a deal, in other words, okay? So the empire is making a deal with the king group, uh, with the, king, the leader, and giving them access to tribute, special treatment, and so on, favoritism of different kinds, and, you know, accommodation to the empire in return for that leader to turn around and tell his own group to obey, again, uh, the landowner, for example, the members of the church, and so on, in order to carry out, you know, certain uh, economic activities, you know, labor, to provide labor, a labor tribute, in other words. That labor tribute was paid to the Spaniards via those king leaders, of course, in certain institutions that the Spanish brought, for example, the encomienda. The encomienda was really a land grant given to a conquistador for conquering lands on behalf of the king of Spain. So if you conquer any land, additional land, on behalf of the king, the king will reward you, in other words, with a land grant. He will give you an encomienda. And an encomienda, what it was, it was a landed estate, and you are the landlord, you're overseeing that land on behalf of the king, but that then, as a landlord, you have certain privileges as well. You have access to the labor of the indigenous groups that live within your domain. They'll have to work for you, they'll have to feed you, and they will have to engage in different projects, and whatever the project might be, you are in command of their labor. And of course, uh, you also have certain responsibilities towards them, and that is to spread the faith. You need to be a good Christian and make sure that they would you know, convert to Christianity as well. The other institution was called the Hacienda, okay, the Hacienda. This institution was born around 1600 onwards, and it replaced the encomienda. And it's a large landed estate in which uh, here is going to be a place where all the needs of the colonies are going to be produced. The colonies needed food, they needed grain, they needed meat, for example, they needed clothing, textile, tools, etc. So the hacienda was also controlled by a landowner, you know, Spanish landowner. And there he had people working for him. For example, there were, you know, uh, people growing things like wheat, corn, vegetables, a farm. Again, uh, it was a cattle ranch. The hacienda was also a cattle ranch. People were tending, you know, cattle or sheep in order to feed the colonists as well. And also there were 
you know, uh, manufacturing taking place, artisans, weaving cloth, cloth, for example, textiles and so on, clothing, hats and boots and, you know, shoes, etc. blacksmiths, you know, uh, creating all types of different tools and the like, the Hacienda. And the Hacienda will be the main economic institution of the Spanish trading empire in the Americas. This, this is where things are being produced for the colonists, in other words. Now, the institution that is going to serve the critical purpose for the Spanish trading empire in terms of exports, something that the Spanish empire is going to be producing for the world market, was the plantation. Okay? The plantation was the economic institution introduced by the Spaniards in order to generate cash crops like sugar and tobacco. And the plantations, again, are going to be built in critical regions like the Caribbean islands, for example, south of Mexico, Central America, where there's hot and humid environments for the production of sugar and tobacco. And those are commodities that could be traded for gold, particularly in the world market. There will be a, 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 an emergent uh, demand, a rise in demand for tobacco and sugar around the world. And the Spanish Empire is going to be producing those commodities on a grand scale on such a scale that this is going to be one of the keys to the success of the Spanish trading empire, the plantation system. Again, that will be scattered across the Americas. And the other, of course, institution introduced by the Spaniards that is also going to be critical for the rise of the Spanish trading empire was mining. In this case, silver mining. There will be two regions that are going to be critical for the massive extraction of silver deposits uh, in the Americas for the Spanish Empire. And those two regions was one in Mexico, in what is called Zacatecas, and the other region will be in uh, Potosí, in South America. Again, massive, massive uh, amounts of silver deposits. And we're going to see here the extraction, the massive extraction of silver all the silver will be pouring into Spain, as we'll see again. And here, the Spaniards are going to use another uh, native practice, tradition, or institution for accessing labor. And that was called uh, Mita, for example. Mita was a type of labor tribute. Again, that was practiced particularly here in South America in what is called, uh, it was really formerly known as the Inca Empire. Again, in this region known as Potosí, for example, we're going to see that the Incas, for example, uh, practiced something called Mita. And Mita was really what it was, was a labor tribute paid to the emperor, okay? a labor tribute. So when the Spaniards arrived to South America, they realized that every member, every subject, of the Inca Empire had to labor for the emperor a few days out of the week, for example. It was part of the tribute to be paid to the emperor. So they used the Mita, that practice, in order to have indigenous peoples working in the silver mines, extracting vast amounts of silver for the Spaniards to be taken to Spain. So this is going to be yet another very critical component for the rise of the Spanish trading empire, and that is silver. Besides the plantations producing things like sugar and tobacco uh, for Spain, we also see the extraction, the massive extraction of silver as well. And of course, the Spaniards also attempt a trade monopoly. Remember, every empire enacts certain practices to monopolize the trade. Again, this is the era of mercantilism. Remember, they're trying to pretty much maximize their exports, while at the same time trying to increase their imports of gold as well into their own uh, coffers. And so what the Spaniards do is that as they're exporting, you know, uh, cash crops like sugar, tobacco from the New World, and silver as well, not to mention, of course, gold as well, the gold that they found uh, in Tenochtitlan and also in South America with the Inca Empire, as they're transferring all this wealth into Spain, they're going to create a special merchant fleet. Again, a merchant fleet in which only ships that were allowed 
again, those are the licensed ships that carry the permits, for example, that are coming from Spain. Particularly, there are two ports that are the official ports on each side of the Atlantic. You know, in, for example, uh, in the New World, there are only two ports where you can export, for example, you know, all the products. And that is the port of Veracruz and in Porto Bello in what is today Panama, for example. Those were the only regions that were allowed to export the products, the crops and the metals, for example. And back in Spain, there were only two ports that they will be receiving as well those products coming from the New World. And that was in Seville and in Cadiz as well. So it was an enclosed, self-contained system that uh, allowed the Spaniards to monitor and regulate the trade between uh, Spain and the colonies in the Americas as well. Again, it was highly, highly monitored in that way and highly regulated, trying to exclude any other party uh, from participating in this network. And with that, of course, they're trying to tighten control of this trade as well. Again, trying to exercise a trade monopoly. Okay, so we have run out of time. When we come back, uh, we're going to look at some other empires, in this case, the North European empires, the Dutch, the French, and the British. And after that, we're looking at the Mughal and uh, the, Ch uh, the Chinese empire, quite briefly. And once we do that, we're going to look at the global impact of the trading empires. Again, all of that will be explained in the last session after we come back. Thank you.